Yeah. Okay, I'd like to call the December 20th Comox Valley Regional District regular board meeting to order. It's our last regular meeting of 2022. So I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. And as part of our commitment to reconciliation, we familiarize ourselves with the contents of both the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as well as the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And today we have the call to action 15, language and culture. We call upon the federal government to appoint in consultation with Aboriginal groups an Aboriginal languages commissioner. The commissioner should help promote Aboriginal languages and report on the adequacy of federal funding of Aboriginal languages, languages initiatives. And uh, we have done our in-camera portion today and we went in camera under section 90C, K and L of the community charter. Can I get a first and second for that? Our brand Cole Hamilton, thank you. And it's a vote of the full board, all in favor? Oh, sorry, Dr. Helene, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to note that um, I have an item of new business uh, arising from that uh, meeting that I'd like to include later on in the agenda, please. Um, thank you, yes, when we, we will receive it under new business. Thank yeah, you. thank you. So, <laughs> so all in favor of receipt of the in-camera motion. And that's carried, thank you. So now we're on to adoption of minutes from December 6th. Um, McCollum and Grant, thank you. Any uh, comments or questions on those minutes? And it's a vote full board, all in favor of adoption. That's carried. And we're on to reports. Black Creek Oyster Bay Service Committee minutes from December 5th. Grant and Warren, thank you. And is there any discussion on those minutes? Again, it's a vote of the full board. All in favor of receipt. Any opposed? That's carried. And we're on to item two, the Electoral Area Service Committee minutes from December 5th. Yeah. Grieve and Hillian, thank you. Any discussion on those minutes? Okay, again, vote of the full board on receipt. Anyone opposed? It's carried. And there's a recommendation one. Uh, moved by Cole Hamilton, seconded by Grant. And Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. This is a, this is a proposal for a campsite in the Fannie Bay area. And I know um, we've had some delegations in the past around this one and um, some concerns about it, but um, it's for the development permit and everything is in order and I see the applicant is in the room. So um, I'm happy to support it. There may still be uh, future conversations or adjustments to the plan. You never know, that'll be up to the applicant. Um, so I, I encourage everyone to uh, keep chatting in the community and the neighborhood around this and um, and we'll see uh, what happens. So I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to support it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this is development permit for Fannie Bay Resort Inc. And it's a vote of the areas only. No, yeah. yeah, all in favor? And any opposed? That's carried unanimously, thank you. On to recommendation two. Okay. Grieve and Grant, thank you. That's the board approved in principle, the 2023 financial planning process for Valula Creek Village Project and Demon Green Project. Any further discussion? Okay. This, oh, Director Grieve, go ahead. Um, I think it, it's um, come to my attention that, uh, that some of the board members don't quite understand what function this is coming out of. So to be clear, it is coming out of the Demon and the Hornby uh, ECDEF function, correct? Yes, that's correct. They have their own individual functions for economic development that does not involve the mainland of Vancouver Island. I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Director Arbor. 
Okay. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to recommendation three. Yeah. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. And this is uh, in regard to bylaw 232, Denman Island Economic Development Service Establishment Bylaw. And the board affirming the provision of the capital funding for the affordable housing projects. Any further discussion? Director Kerr, go ahead. Thank you. Just as there's no uh, a briefing note on the agenda that I'm looking at, just curious. Um, we're affirming the provision of capital funding. How much? How much is that capital funding? Is there? I just don't have much detail on on what we're voting for. The um, intention, I believe, is for $100,000, and uh, Director Arbor may be able to provide a little bit more information. But um, it was a matter that uh, was considered by the Electoral Area Services Committee and the recommendation there, so the reports are available through those minutes. Director Arbor. Great. I love it when there's questions on these. Um, so what happened, the background on that is we thought, or I thought anyways, uh, or assumed even that we could apply community works funding to these types of projects, but um, the federal and provincial government apparently don't uh, allow uh, funds to go to housing through that part of funding, even though they've added fire hall. There's like a disavailability of just about everything under the sun except housing. So we're having to rejig for uh, Hornby. Um, we have had already passed commitment last year for a contribution of 100,000 towards a, what will probably be a $12 million project. And for Denman, it's early stage, so also 100. And it's almost an expectation of BC housing that uh, local government contributes some dollars to those projects now to get them going. Um, so that's going back to uh, prior things of being downloaded or being pulled into the housing scene or the rest of it. It was interesting for me to find out that we could not use our internal resources um, to participate in the project when we're being told to contribute. Um, so we're looking to use the economic development function as one idea. And the other thing that could come back before the board in the future is to actually create a housing service specific to Hornby and or Denman. So that will be explored this coming year. Thank you for the background, Director Grieve. Um, getting back to the pre previous point, um, I'm just wondering if for our municipal partners, if we could put a hyperlink on there to what EASC meeting that came from, uh, because, uh, you know, we don't have an item uh, hyperlink on there for the actual specific item, but at least if it, re if it referred back to the minutes from that particular meeting, save everybody going through it, because quite often it'd be, it, uh, I've been asked by some municipal uh, directors, you know, where'd that come from? Of course, it came from electoral areas or it came from the Black Week Oyster Bay system or whatever. So just to make it easier for everybody to reference it if they wanted to. Thank you. Yeah, I see staff nodding that they can do that. Okay, any further questions? We're on item three. It's above the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Okay, we're on to recommendation four. Second. Grant and Armour, thank you. And this is regarding the 2022-2026 financial plan and capital expenditure program for Royston Water Local Service Area. Any discussion? It's all around water infrastructure expenses. And it's above the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to item three, the Comox Valley Sewage Commission minutes from December 6th. Hillian and McCollum, thank you. And again, so are there any discussion on those minutes? Oh yeah, oh, no, okay. And it's both full board. All in favor of receipt of the minutes. Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Okay, recommendation one. Uh, it's moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. And Director Arbor, go ahead. Is there a reason why Area A is voting on this one? It says A, Courtney and Goals. There is. Oh, there is. So I'm curious. 
Yep. Okay. Jake Martins, general manager of, of what have you done? services, will provide a response. <laughs> Thank you, Russell, through the chair. Yeah, this is the first instance in which a matter that has come before the sewage commission uh, has been directed to come forward to the board in regards to a bylaw matter. And as electoral area is now a participant in the sewage service, uh, you are now entitled to vote on those matters that come before the board. The um, as, as you will note, of course, you do not have participation at the sewage commission at this point. That's, of course, anticipated at a later date. Um, but given that the service ultimately has been amended to include you as a participant, you are eligible to vote on these matters. That's that's fantastic. I'd like to say this is a historical vote. And I just I just wish that Courtney and Comox were equally divided on this very topic so that my vote could actually be consequential. <laughs> Okay, so going back to the recommendation, it's in regard to um, updating the seppage tipping fees as well as updating the skyrocket volumetric rates. Any further discussion? Okay, it's a vote of area A, Courtney and Comox. All in favor? Any opposed? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to item four of the Comox Valley Water Committee minutes from December 6th. Mm -hmm. Grieve and Morin, thank you. Any discussion on those minutes? Okay, and it's a vote of full board. All in favor of receipt. Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we have the regional parks and trails committee minutes from December 6th. Mm -hmm. The first meeting of that committee. Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. Any discussion on those minutes? Okay, it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Oh, sorry, before we go, Director Helene, go ahead. Just to note that this is indeed a historic occasion. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. All in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Okay, on to item six, which is the Comox Valley Recreation Minutes from December 6th. Moved by Cole Hamilton, seconded by Arbor, and discussion on those minutes. Okay, again, a vote of the full board on favor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I keep missing you, Director Helene. There you go. Um, thanks very much, Chair. I, I just wanted to um, thank staff for the, uh, the tour we had of facilities in general um, last week. And um, the, uh, I found the recreation uh, part of it in particular uh, significant uh, in relation particularly to the, um, the pool where um, uh, it's been closed for a while because of significant leaks. And I believe that uh, there may be consideration um, in uh, the reports that we're looking to come forward on both uh, facilities and the aquatic study that's going on about uh, the, the future of that facility. It was just very interesting to see what possibilities might exist uh, without prejudging anything that might come forward. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge staff in that regard. Thanks. Thank you, Director. And Director Greet, go ahead. Well, just speaking to the minutes, um, I'm wondering if um, there's a, a, a mission of the alternate director, uh, Little Rock. Would he be listed as being present? Because he was at the uh, on the tour. So, where is he? Oh, this is not oh, the tour. He wasn't sworn in yet. This Wait, is the, we're still on the rec commission. We'll we're see. not on committee of the whole. Oh, we're not there yet. I'm sorry, but Jake's ready to answer that question. Answer it, Emily. He's all ready to go here. Come on. <laughs> okay, so we're still on rec commission. All in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And now we're on to Move committee to of the poll. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Cole Hamilton. And Director Grieve, was there a, a need to amend the minutes? Yeah, that was, yeah. An omission of an alternate director? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, so um, in, in this case, the minutes reflect the attendance of our board directors. And in the case of electoral area directors, their alternate uh, is their their uh, duties, their, their uh, authorities, their powers only come into play in the absence of the director. And so uh, although this was a, a, a tour, a workshop in some senses uh, for the formal purposes at least, um, 
it's either the director or the alternate director that attends, uh, not both. So. Okay, and I did want to extend my thanks to staff of all the facilities that we visited. Um, the tour was very well received. Thank you. And we're on receipt of the Community of the Whole for December 13th. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Thank you. And before we move on to eight, we actually will need to consider the addendum and receive the correspondence. So thank you, Arbor and Hillian. So that we'll have to um, jump to the back of the agenda for that addendum. And hopefully you've all had a chance to read the four letters that came in for the temporary use permit on Rhine Road East. Um, so all in favor of receipt of the addendum. Okay, any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And I guess we can move on. If there's no discussion on those letters, we can move on to um, the recommendation. So. Okay. Second. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Hillian. So the recommendation is around the approval of the temporary use permit for a term of three years for the Ryan Road East property. Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. It was interesting. Uh, I think today or yesterday or the day before um, in the Comox Valley record, the, I think the town of Comox is going to see a new return at, uh, depot somewhere. So right in their footsteps is uh, Area B. And uh, so I think it's interesting, you know, where that um, that issue doesn't go away of how to provide better recycling facilities. And it's nice to see that uh, that is a project on the horizon for Area B that will uh, um, help backfill some of the, the demand. Thank you. And Director Grant, go ahead. Yeah, and just further to that, it's uh, it's going to be one of those return at express and goes in January. It's going to be in the Comox Mall parking lot. So we finding a location was the hard part, but the mall guys agreed to have it there. So I think it's going to be well received. That's good to hear. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, this one is a vote of the areas only. All in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we're on to recommendation two. Right. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Grant, and that is in regards to the Rural Community Grant and the awarding of $10,000 to Hornby Island Community School Parent Advisory Council. Any further discussion? Director Arbor, go ahead. Thanks, probably, probably the last uh, rural grant for the year. And uh, it was noted at the ASC that this is in partnership with the school district and the education society. And I think it's great that Hornby does not a lot of rec facilities, but um, the swing set that disappeared a few years ago, it'll be great to, to see it come back pending confirmation of funding by other uh, agencies. Thank you for that. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the full board. All in favor of receipt, or sorry, approval. <laughs> yeah, yes. And any opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. And item nine is the orientation for transit service. Moved by Cole Hamilton, seconded by Grant. Thank you very much, Chair and directors. And Mike Zabarski is here to provide the orientation for transit and answer any of your questions. Thanks, Russell. Oh, I need the clicker. Nice. We'll click, point this way. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, so today we're just gonna give a presentation on the uh, transit service and I'm happy to answer any questions throughout or after. Uh, many of you know about our uh, transit service already. And for those that don't, this is hopefully some good information. Uh, so it's a regional transit service and we, we serve a wide area and I'll show some maps later of where that is. Um, some of the fundamentals, we have a service area establishment bylaw that talks about very basic things like our, our purpose to provide transit service, the participants being the three municipalities, 
uh, adult fertile areas A, B, and a portion of C. Uh, the governance for this service is through the board, and it's supported by a staff level transit management advisory committee um, appointed by the CAO. The service provides conventional and custom transit. So conventional is the like fixed route, fixed uh, schedule, the big buses you typically see. Uh, custom service in includes primarily handy dart service, but also we have some community bus service areas out in Lazo Point Homes, uh, Hugh Van Seal Bay area, and um, down to uh, Union Bay and up through like Murrayville headquarters, uh, including some traditional on-demand service, so where you would phone ahead and request a, a trip. Um, but they're a fairly small amount of the service we provide. Uh, as mentions, we mentioned, we do have uh, bus service within the three municipalities and the surrounding electoral areas. We go all the way down to Fannie Bay. We do not connect right now to Nanaimo. Uh, and we do go all the way up to Oyster River and connect to uh, the Campbell River Transit Service up there. So our kind of guiding documents is the Transit Future Plan that was adopted in 2014. And then a, an update on that was conducted this year called the Transit Future Action Plan. And that really focuses in on what are the priorities and, and service investigations that we want to do in the next few years. So that's kind of how we're how we're planning to improve transit. That's what, what staff are using to um, you know, recommend transit service improvements and build the budgets, et cetera. Um, the service is operated through a partnership. We work very closely with BC Transit, obviously. Um, they're our kind of provincial uh, connection to this. They provide a lot of the expertise. They own the buses. Um, they are the ones that directly contract with the operator, uh, which is, as shown here is PW Transit. Um, and then they bring about, you know, 50% of the funding for conventional and almost 70% of the funding for, for the custom side of things. CBRD is responsible for deciding service levels and, and kind of where we provide service to. So we're in the community, we're the ones that get to decide what's the transit service that we want to see in our community. Uh, we also decide bus fares and we get 100% of the bus fare revenue back. Uh, there's the cost share mentioned there. So we're, we're about 50% on conventional and a third of the custom transit. Transit infrastructure is also a shared uh, responsibility and partnership. Um, for this one, we also include the municipality. So the bus stops, bus shelters that are within each jurisdiction or their bus shelters and their bus stops. So they, so for example, the, the ones in the town of Comox are owned and maintained by the town of Comox. Uh, and same for the other municipalities. We do get support from BC Transit. They have a funding program for shelters. They provide expertise and advice on, on where to put bus stops. Uh, as, as some of you know, there, there's been some work recently on the larger infrastructure, like uh, transit exchanges, transit operations facilities. And so those are heavily supported by BC Transit at the planning stage right now and in the future in the funding as well. Uh, and just a, to note also that we do have some, some transit on Hornby and Denman Island. We do that in partnership with the Hornby Island Economic Enhancement Corp and the Denman Works uh, Economic uh, Enhancement Service there. So those are um, essentially at this point funds that we transfer to those groups and they then deliver the service on the islands through contracts or by uh, operating it themselves. So here's a couple images. One on the left is showing the transit service area. So the red portion is where is the service area participants. And you can see that on the uh, top, the large white area is the, the part of the portion of area C that is not included in the transit service and then does not pay for it. On the right is the handy dart service boundary. Um, you can see it's primarily around the kind of urban core, uh, a little bit down in Royston, a little bit up uh, up towards Seal Bay area. Uh, but primarily, it's it's the municipal boundaries that we provide handy dart service in. Some of the current projects we're working on, we've got the um, sewer conveyance project next year, and that is going to have a significant impact on transit. So we're working right now on, on kind of two scenarios for scheduling and routing, one being a cost neutral scenario where we don't have any more money to play with, and that will mean reasonably significant uh, service 
impact on us, on especially on the level of service, the number of trips per hour. A lot of the existing service hours will have to go into kind of the extra trip times. Uh, so a trip that used to take 15 minutes might take 20 minutes or 25 minutes. So a lot of the hours are going to get chewed up in, in that. Um, but we're hopeful that we'll have uh, a, a bit of a money to play with. So the board did, through the transit improvement program this year, approve a 3,000 hour expansion, not expansion, but a 3,000 hour investment to maintain service levels next year. And we're just waiting to hear from the province on, on their share of funding. Uh, so it's our hope that we will be able to maintain service levels next year during the sewer conveyance project. But regardless, it will be a very different transit schedule uh, with some, some different routing, especially on, on the routes that go through Comox and along Dyke Road. So that's a big piece of work we're doing right now with, with BC Transit um, and our, our engineering team and, of course, Town Comox. Uh, another piece of work we're doing with the city of Courtney is some planning of the routing through the downtown. Uh, there's a number of kind of things going on in the downtown area. There's some work that the city's doing on their cycling uh, master plan, the Sixth Street pedestrian bridge, some design work going around some of the intersections, and some look at the uh, signal timing. Uh, in addition, we have that planned exchange, uh, new exchange downtown. So with the change in location of the exchange, there is some requirements to change the routing to, to kind of access that exchange. And the, the hope is that it's a more direct and efficient routing. Uh, right now, it's a bit circuitous with how we, how we navigate around the downtown to try and access the existing exchange. Uh, upcoming projects from a service planning perspective, uh, we have a 500 hour handy dart expansion that the board also approved this year that will be uh, hopefully on the road for January 2024. Uh, and that's looking at extending service into the weekend or sorry, weekday, uh, pardon me, extending weekday service into the evenings. We currently operate till 430 weekdays and, and we would hope to make that a little bit later. And then Post sewer conveyance project, um, we also have that 3,000 hour expansion on the books. And so we'll be doing some work at some point in the near future to determine how best to use those hours, uh, primarily looking at, at things that are in the Transit Future Action Plan. So some of those initial service improvements that were contemplated in, the, in that plan. Uh, and then some of the service investigation work that was also contemplated in the Transit Future Action Plan is, is going to be coming up soon. So, for example, looking at digital on-demand transit, uh, looking at connections to the South Island uh, through the Nanaimo service or, or, or elsewhere, and then also looking at a BC Transit offered service on, on Hornby and Denman uh, versus the kind of community partnership level service that we have right now. On the infrastructure side, uh, we've brought a couple of big studies through the board recently. Uh, we had the operations and maintenance facility most recently. Uh, right now, the existing facility is, is a leased property that our operator owns. It's not in the best location, does not have the capacity to do electric bus charging. Uh, there's a number of other kind of issues with that site. And so we are looking to purchase another property and build uh, a new facility. Uh, BC Transit are currently looking to acquire that property. That's that's the stage that we're in right now. Is BC Transit out there looking to find a five-acre property that's got the appropriate zoning and is in the appropriate locations and and meets their other criteria before actually purchasing that property? They will be back to the board uh, with a bit more of a business case and just some information on on next steps. So. Hopefully, uh, in, in the near future, they'll have a property uh, lined up. And the other piece of work we did recently was on transit exchanges and transit priority measures. So there were there was a study uh, that finished up last year that identified a number of new new uh, exchanges, transit exchanges, also some transit priority features like a queue jumper lane at some of the key intersections that we'd like to kind of get through quicker and not get caught up in congestion. Uh, so these are these are projects that we're working with BC Transit right now on the funding side of things, uh, aiming to have a, an application in to the uh, federal government in March of 2023. So BC Transit is kind of the, the lead applicant on our behalf, and we're just supporting them in that work right now. And then hopefully middle of the year, we would hear back on, on the grant status and move into the, the design phase, which 
very likely will include a fairly significant uh, engagement process with you know neighboring properties and, and residents and bus riders, of course. And then the other piece of work that's ongoing right now is the UMO electronic fare collection system. So as of about middle of next year, people are going to be able to pay with digital means on the bus. So no longer are they going to have a kind of old old fashioned magnetic stripe uh, pass to pay. Uh, they will be able to pay cash, but otherwise it'll be through a reloadable smart card or through an app or through your, your tap credit card or debit card. Um, the biggest part of, of our involvement on this at the moment is the public engagement process. So it's a very big change to how people pay uh, to use the bus service. So we're, we're definitely spending a lot of time on trying to get the message out, or we will be. A um, bit of a financial overview. This is 2022's uh, budget, um, almost $3.9 million in the operating budget. We don't currently have any capital. Uh, we are going to have some capital uh, in the future with exchanges and uh, and the facility, but at the moment there isn't any. Um, primarily, we fund this through requisitions, which is currently at two point six million dollars, split between the municipalities and and the electoral areas. And the remaining comes from bus fare revenue, uh, some reserves that we have, some advertising uh, money that we get for on bus advertising. Uh, we this year have some safe restart money uh, and a little bit next year that we got from from the pandemic um, recovery and often we have a little bit of a surplus that we bring forward and, and that was the case with 2022 as well. Uh, the primary expenditure in this um, in this budget is the operating contract with with BC Transit at 3.1 million. Uh, we also have a smaller operating contract on Demon and Hornby. Some of the trends in transit, and there are many, um, really positive one um, to start with is the ridership recovery. So with the pandemic, there was obviously a significant drop in, in ridership as people were, were locked down and, and not traveling around. Uh, we have now actually exceeded our pre-pandemic levels. We're one of only a, a couple of communities in BC that have, have done this well. Uh, most of the province is still kind of in the 80% recovered mode, we're, we're about 105 or 110 percent. Um, so we're doing really well. And I think that kind of speaks to that second bullet uh, is that we have a lot of demand for service here. And, and maybe it's people trying to find a more affordable way of, of getting around and save save on their household costs. Uh, but I think also there's there's been a lot of uh, really positive development and land use changes. We've been densifying on that core. Uh, we've got a lot more people living where bus routes are, really good bus routes. So I think that's a lot of why we're seeing um, good ridership recovery, but but we continue to have strong demand for service. So we do need to continue to, to provide service improvements to meet that demand. Um, we're starting, or we have started to, to kind of look a little bit more about on the social and, and equity side of things, whereas previously it was all about ridership. Now we're looking at maybe, um, you know, performance around coverage and you know making sure that people can get to their medical appointments or their social visits or participate in the economy uh so we're, we're we're looking at bus services you know not just about ridership uh also providing that critical link to a lot of people in our community interest in digital and, and technological solutions so we mentioned umo uh, a couple of years ago we had the next ride system uh put in the buses which had gps it had a um, kind of a, an app that you could download and see where the bus was at all times and do your trip planning. Uh, and then moving into digital on demand in the future. So there, there is definitely some interest in, in how technology is going to change how we use transit. Infrastructure requirements, uh, we're, we're pretty much, you know, at capacity with a number of our exchanges where it's going to start limiting our ability to grow the service. Uh, we are looking for newer and bigger and better exchanges to not just allow that uh, capacity uh, improvement, but also improve the, the customer experience, improve the, you know, the experience for people that are waiting for the bus or trying to connect from one bus to another. Um, and a lot of, you know, interest in, in electric buses. So some of that infrastructure requirements are, are being driven by the need to electrify the fleet. 
congestion and construction impacts. This is something I keep hoping, you know, oh, it's just this year and then the construction stuff's going to be done and transit's going to be back, you know, on, on time and schedule. But, you know, year after year, we're seeing very significant construction projects with a significant impact on transit. Um, you know, fixed route transit doesn't really have that easy ability to choose a different road like a, like somebody in a private automobile. Uh, so we often get kind of stuck in these these construction related traffic uh, situations and we're, we're seeing another one come up next year. We just kind of got through the fifth street bridge project and we're, we're going to go straight into that um, sewer conveyance project next year. So it, it definitely is hurting um, transit and, you know, making it maybe a less desirable choice than we would, we would like to position it as. Uh, so hopefully after the sewer conveyance project, that's it. We're done. No more, no more big capital construction projects. Right. Um, and then just the final point there trend is, is that being nimble is challenging. I, I hear a lot of requests for new service to some area or a different kind of service. Um, it's tough when we're working with other partners like BC Transit and our operating company and, you know, we're, we're making um, decisions once a year on service expansions for the following years. So these changes just don't happen very quickly. And and yeah, it's a challenge for sure. As much as we'd like to be a little more nimble, it, it's tough with the current uh, arrangement. And just this last slide here before I jump into questions. So this, this graphic kind of illustrates uh, how we work through transit improvements and you know, providing transit on an annual basis where we have the transit improvement program kind of shown on the right there. That's our, our one chance a year where we get to decide on service levels for the for the next year um, how much expansion do we want to put forward what do we want to use it for you know that then gets kind of built into our budgets and eventually implemented but it, it's a you know it's an annual process where um, you know back to that point on nimbleness it, it takes a while to, to see these changes so um yeah with that I'll, I'll kind of stop there and open it up to any questions or comments. Great, thanks, Mike. And uh, I'll uh, call on Director Arbor. Let's see if this works. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, thanks for the good presentation, Mike. And there are a lot of good news, I think, with our transit system, as you see in the post-pandemic world. And uh, um, it's nice to see that number one, you know, everything coming together with uh, especially Courtney and Comox putting the density along our route, <laughs> our number one route. All of a sudden, as you report, we're starting to see ridership go way up. So that densification process working really well to get people out of their cars onto the bus and also improve affordability. That's awesome. Um, I just have four things, um, just four things. They'll be quick. I do that once a year. It's always around now. So the night a meeting. It was a meeting for transit. I passionate about transit. Um so um the report thanks for continuing to work on the, the link to Nanaimo. That's the missing eight kilometers between Campbell River and Victoria. And perhaps someday we'll have a train running. Um, but if it doesn't run, I think transit is the next best thing to um allow a range of people to commute. And there was a good report in the Lee Cowichan Gazette yesterday. I don't know if you saw it, that the uh, they just launched a Cowichan to Nanaimo route. And they're seeing about 100 users a day just in, in early days. So that's not too bad at all. Um, the transit facility, I'm almost thinking whether, um, I think it's in the, uh, something I mentioned at a previous meeting, whether we should actually... Um, so BC Transit is approaching us for major investment uh, around a transit facility that we would have to pursue grant. And, and uh, I understand we're actually moving at a, a good clip on that project, but I still would like to see maybe if our board would like to write to the school district board to see if they would have an interest in at least scoping out a partnership around that. Um, it's always a photo of my mind that we don't find greater synergy between school buses and transit buses, number one. And number two, um, with the, uh, with a forty million dollar investment, I do wonder if there'd be economies of scale in having a couple of partners at the table, major partners. Yeah, I assume the school district is going to plan to electrify their buses, 
either through provincial orders or through the leadership of the local board, but it's bound to happen at some point. And so I'm wondering if we should um, send a letter before we get too deep into our own project. Um, I'll save the third one. It was Hornby Denman, but I'll save it for next year for Dr. Dr. Matt. And uh, the last one is I'm wondering, you know, I've been thinking about the 12 years and younger for free. That, and, and I'm wondering if this term, we should look at 18 years and younger to write free because uh, our teenagers around the valley, that's where you develop a lot of your, of your traveling habits. And um, and I think it might be beneficial for our teenagers to circulate around town. And I'd be curious at least to see the uh, financial impact of that. Thank you. And uh, Director McCullough. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, my question's around um, the additional hours that's um, going to be required as a result of the sewer conveyance project. And I had kind of thought of this question after we were looking at the traffic management um, plan or um, coming plan at the Sewage Commission meeting. So now I have an opportunity to ask it now. But um, the queue jumping lane was uh, well received from what I understand from uh, BC Transit when we used it with the Fifth Street project. And is there any opportunities that you know of um, to implement uh, queue jumping in, in some parts of this project? Or uh, I know we're constrained for space, but has there been any discussion around that that you know of? Yeah, there has been some discussion. Um, at this point, there's no plan for any kind of bus lane or, or queue jumping, but there, you know, there could be if there was uh, willingness by the municipalities and MOTI, uh, probably along kind of the route one. So, you know, not going through the congested construction area, but traveling, you know, Anderton, Lurwick, Ryan Road, if we could, you know, facilitate a, a bus only lane or a queue jump, temporary queue jumper lane during the construction period, that would really, I think, show that the the transit is the preferred method to to travel during that that time um, and provide that advantage to transit because there will be a, a lot more vehicles traveling along those other routes. They're not going to be going necessarily on, on Dyke Road between Courtney and Comox. They're going to be taking the alternate routes. And so traffic congestion on those routes will be worse than it is today, which is already getting kind of bad. Uh, and so having yeah having some kind of a a bus lane or, or a queue jumper along that corridor would be would be great. Um, but obviously we, we need the municipalities and MOTI to um, kind of work with us on that one. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, just uh, e even after the minor disruptions from last week, it really underscores that this project is going to make the Fifth Street disruption seem pretty small, I think. And uh, just looking at how many additional bus hours we'd need to mm -hmm. maintain the current service levels, it's, uh, yeah, definitely highlighting um, what a major thing this is going to be. Uh, and then my other question was around the UMO. Um, that's the digital, I don't, I don't know. Fair what payment. That, what, fair what, payment or fair, fair payment. Is yeah. that the name of the um, UMO product? Brand. Okay. Is yeah. The, I don't know what the rationale is for calling it UMO, but. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just, just so I know what I'm, what I'm saying there. Um, is that replacing um, the current form or is it in addition to the, um, you know, the change thing. I know when uh, TransLink implemented digital payment, they did take out the ability to receive cash. So I'm just curious if that's the way we're going or if it's an additional level it's, of service. It's replacing the current fare boxes on the buses, but it will also have a cash Capacity. spot. Yeah. Okay. So people will still be able to pay with, with cash on the bus, um, but there will be a, a new fare box and a little validator that sticks on a on post. Um, so you can tap it. So kind of in addition, yeah. That's great. Brand, brand new everything, but still allowing the cash. That's great to hear. I think um, that's definitely the way it needs to go. It needs to be convenient and people aren't carrying mm -hmm. as much cash. So yeah, thanks for that. Great, thanks. And uh, Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Mike. Uh, three quick questions. Uh, I used to sit with a uh, um, 
fellow counselor who often lamented uh, whenever we talked about transit funding that she saw empty buses all the time. So I'm really pleased that um, as I drive around the community myself, I see people waiting at bus stops all over. Uh, and I'm just wondering uh, what sort of feedback we're getting from uh, customers about uh, the state of those bus stops during our snow events. Uh, yeah, they're not thrilled about the uh, snow. It's it's hard to get to the bus stop because the sidewalks are, are covered in snow. And, and then when they get there, they have to climb over a you know, mountain of piled up snow from, from the snow clearing. Um, so that's definitely a challenge uh, for, for customers right now. And we're, we're getting a lot of um, negative feedback right now on, on that, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I wonder if in that light, uh, those of us who are... Uh particularly municipal directors might uh, uh, do a better job of advocating at our tables for uh, um, an effort to be made uh, because uh, this is a time when people are very dependent on that uh, transport. And so to, to get those uh, access points to the bus stops cleared, I think is important. Uh, second question, uh, you noted in your report that uh, you're working on some uh, route uh, changes in uh, Courtney. And uh, I understand you may have been in discussion with uh, management at Oceanfront Village, would that be one of the routes that you're you're looking to add a stop to? Yeah, we did hear from them and we're looking at where it could be and we've got to work with the City of Courtney uh, staff to kind of determine the best location for that one. So it's a somewhat challenging location, but we're, we're still working on it. Well, how long does a process like that normally take? <laughs> normally, um, I, I would expect it, you know, it should be something that we can have a decision on within another month. Okay, great. Yeah. And then my final question, um, I was just looking at where uh, transit passes are available, and I noticed that they're almost exclusively uh, municipal facilities, um, but there are, um, I believe, two commercial establishments, both Rexall drugstores. Do we have a deal with Rexall, or is there is there a rationale behind uh, why we go to one pharmacy, one commercial establishment, and not another? Um, yeah, with CBRD does have a, a contract with the Rexalls, and we did try to get contracts with other pharmacies, grocery stores, you know, other agencies, and Rexall was the only one willing to to help us out. So we're we're very thankful of them in helping out. Um, they don't get any any revenue from it. They don't take a commission, so they're kind of doing this as a customer service uh, piece. Um, and moving into the UMO electronic fare payment world, we're going to be kind of handing over the, the vendor management to BC Transit. So they're actually negotiating with um, private companies. I don't know who, uh, but they've told us there is, there are, they're looking for one or two uh, places, commercial places that cover all of BC and they're going to have uh, those vendors signed up in addition to possibly the local vendors that we have like Rexall and the local government facilities. So it will be, I think, a lot less necessary moving forward with UMO because once you buy that reloadable smart card, you can reload it from your, your phone, your home computer. You don't need to go in every month and buy a physical pass. Um, but we do need to maintain some kind of level of minimum access to uh, to buy smart card in the first place or you can go in and top it up at a, at a vendor yeah for sure because of course we have people seniors uh, people who are in house who may not have access to uh, yeah. phones or computers uh, so i guess we can hope for the day when uh, it becomes a really hot ticket that commercial interests are clamoring to make it available yeah <laughs> thanks <laughs> And Director Moran took me a second. Great, here. thank you. Um, thanks so much. I, I get so excited about transit, actually. I know my colleague across the way there doesn't see it as much in Comox, um, maybe the, the proprietorship um, increasing, but in Courtney, <clears throat> as Director Hillian said, I, I see full buses and people at bus stops, which is awesome. A couple of questions. Um, one of them is around... Um, I guess it was just a couple of us um, had the opportunity to meet with North Island, excuse me, <clears throat> North Island College folks, um, just as a bit of an update on some things happening up there. And of course, the, the housing is, um, the student housing is in the works and it's, um, it's a little ways down 
the road, but I'm just wondering if, you know, we, we said we would advocate for some, some service up, some increased service up there because that's going to add quite a number of people in that area. So I just wondered if you had any updates on that or communication with the college around all that housing and folks in that area. Excuse me. Yeah, we have met with uh, staff at the college, talk about the unfortunate impact of constructing the, the new housing on, on the bus routes to go through there. Um, but we, we did also talk a little bit about um, you know, the opportunity of having, I think it's around a couple hundred mm -hmm. units and, and I don't think they're planning any additional parking. Uh, so, you know, prime transit user opportunity here. So, yeah. um, you know, providing a higher level service to the college, I think is always a good idea. And especially if they've got 200 units of, of housing going in there. Um, so, you know, coming out of the sewer humanities project, we're going to have that, that 3000 hours mm -hmm. available to do, whatever we want with and you know a lot of what was identified as a priority in the transit future action plan will provide better service to to the college um some of the other, other partnership opportunities that we may want to talk to the college about is is the exchange that we have up there so we, we were planning to build a, a, an improved exchange at the college um near the aquatic center hospital kind of area there and so is there an opportunity for for them to contribute to that as part of their their capital works that they're doing um and then also the u pass so in other universities and colleges they have the universal bus mm -hmm. pass and they they charge students as part of their tuition for that and yes they get free access so to speak after that uh, so that is something that's been identified in the past as something that we might want to kind of work with them on and unfortunately in the past we haven't been uh, that hasn't been received well by the, the student union at the college so that but that has been a couple of years so it might be a, a time to review and revisit that if we start to talk about some of these other partnerships and improving service up there yeah, um, and, and of course we have lots of density happening up. We've got all kinds of new uh, units going up in that general area as well. So it's probably a prime opportunity. Um, and kind of moving on to the farmer's market, I know that it's it's in the, the future action plan, but it was a, excuse me, a bit low, <clears throat> excuse me, lower priority uh, further out. And I know there was some discussion that we could bump up the priority of items. So I'm just wondering when the opportunity for that discussion would be because I'm I'm still, you know, hearing quite a bit from the farmers market folks around. And that is a bear quite a barrier to mm -hmm. to um you know lower income folks who are trying to get to the market or whatever. Yeah. Um, so the best way to do it is through that transit improvement program where annually we get a chance to tell BC Transit what we want to do as far as service improvements and, and expansions and, and what we're willing to kind of commit financially to that. Um, so the next opportunity for tips is going to be, you know, spring, summer in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the kind of default that that BC Transit will be recommending is is those top priorities out of the Transit Future Action Plan, and I can't recall exactly where where the um, the farmers market um, and the food bank was was the other one. We were yeah. kind of dealing with both through the improvements to Route Number Five, um, but yeah, that would be the opportunity for the board to say, actually, we want to put that one first or that you know. Right. Pick the year, you know, if it's, if it's yeah, because it was a, it was a little ways or... down down the road. And yeah. I would um, also just support uh, Director Arbor's um, idea of having um, free transit for up to you know eighteen or or whatever. Um, I think that's another great opportunity to get <clears throat> young people trained trained in using transit and um, and and that behavior change. And my just my last item is just. Um, around trends and, and the social equity piece. Um, and then that balance that you talked about where, you know, I think we want to, to be able to um, provide more opportunity for people who experience ba barriers to transportation. Um, but then we're also wanting to um, create some new riot people who've never taken transit before and, and, and try to, to uh, increase that ridership. And I know that we we often do collect public feedback and um, 
we have surveys and things like that. But I just wondered just around that particular, uh, those those two um, aspects, if if there's anything planned or, or would we be able to look at um, focus groups or connecting with nonprofits or, or health and social services around um, those particular needs for, for people with barriers, accessibility barriers, all those things, and then maybe something for those to target those potential new riders. And maybe that's just all pie in the sky, but I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. Thanks. Yeah, I think I think the survey and engagement work that was done through the Transit Future Action Plan did a really good job of kind of teasing out those interests. You know, that was a fairly widespread uh, engagement process, and we got a lot of feedback through that, and including a lot about um, some of these more social equity pieces. Uh, and I think that's reflected in the in the prior to priorities that we identified and and you know I don't I don't think I wouldn't suggest that the the farmers market and the food bank were were kind of lower priorities like this whole transit future action plan is the next few years kind of thing I mean up, up to the board obviously to continue to invest to to move it along at that pace but these were the the priorities that we were kind of contemplating in the in the very short term like over the next few years so having having that improvement to route five um you know, really, it's up to the board. How how quickly is it? Year one or year three? I mean, it's they're all coming soon. So, I think we've got a pretty good idea of of what those um those interests are, and we have a plan to provide the service that will will meet those needs. Um, and at this point, it's really just about kind of deciding well, exactly when uh, are we willing to do that? You know, next year or the year after. Um, and through the tips process to kind of you know make make that decision on how quickly we do it so i don't know that there's any need to really go back out and do any more survey work i think we're pretty we've got a pretty good understanding of, of the needs and it's just about putting it on the road now great thank you and uh director Kerr. Thank you. Uh, just a question. Um, I saw charging on an earlier slide. So just kind of curious about the, the pace and the scale of electrification of the fleet. And again, maybe this was discussed in detail in the last term, but for my benefit, maybe just a quick summary, you know, are our current is our current bus fleet, you know, brand new so that electrification will happen later or is our bus fleet getting towards the end of its life and therefore we could do that sooner? Just curious about, uh, about that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Um, a bit of a mix. So some of our fleet is, is getting pretty close to replacement and a bunch of it is fairly new too. So we have the kind of the handy dart fleet is nearing the end of its of its life. Um, the really big conventional buses are also nearing the end of life. The kind of medium and smaller ones are all fairly new. And the plan that BC Transit has developed um, has been to kind of replace those vehicles with electric vehicles. Um, when electric vehicles are kind of more readily available. So they're they're just piloting 10 electric buses down in Victoria in 2023. Um, and then, I mean, I should say that they're not available, but BC Transit kind of needs to get comfortable with, with them and determine how best to use them. And so they're, yeah, they're piloting 10 in 2023 and then rolling them out kind of based on the results of that pilot, pilot study and also kind of factoring in the replacement cycle of our buses one of the big key factors on timing is the charging infrastructure. So having that facility uh, ready to go uh, is a real important thing and, and being able to tell BC Transit, yes, we're committed and, and we want this facility and making a plan for you know if five years from now that it's gonna be ready to go, that, that will help BC Transit uh, determine their deployment schedule um, and, you know, hopefully prioritize our community because we're ready. Uh, alternatively, if, if we're not there yet, then they might be looking to deploy those first run of buses to, to other communities. So it's hard to say exactly when we're going to get them, but my my guess is, is that we're, you know, probably five to seven years away before we start seeing um, those buses in our fleet. I mean, just just the, the facility alone is probably a, a five year project to have the charging infrastructure in place. So I think that would be the earliest that we would have electric vehicles in the fleet. 
And then it's you know subject to the kind of marketplace as well. There are some challenges we understand with procuring buses these days with, with everything else. So um, hopefully that doesn't delay us too much. So yeah, a few years away for sure. Great, thank you. And uh, Director Barber. Yeah. Sorry, just a second. Just a, a quick one. So the, one of the good news story coming out of uh, FCM's advocacy is in 2026, there's a permanent public transit fund at 3 billion a year. That's about to get unleashed for 10 years. And in comparison, when you look at all the gas tax fund and for community building fund, that's 2 billion a year. So that's that's a massive, massive amount of, of cash that's coming in. There was a public consultation closing on October 14th. Did we submit to that? And yeah. if so, what did we say? Um, send us all the money. We want it all. That's what I said. Yeah, no, we we uh, you know we've had some experience, or I guess kind of gotten an understanding of the existing funding programs. Uh, these are the ones we're chasing for the kind of first set of infrastructure priorities. Um, and you know, one of the challenges with that one was that it wasn't a permanent, stable, you know, long term plan. So. I think we were very we were very supportive of the the need for um, a stable you know significant fund like that. That that stuff's really critical for us to be able to plan and and build that infrastructure. Um, we are getting funding through that already through our our buses. They've they've provided a lot of the funding towards you know the recent buses that have been acquired, and so that's that's helped keep our costs reasonable. And you know those are kind of the things we we mentioned. Is just this stuff's really critical and important, and you know we need to continue to have that. Um, thanks so much, Mike. And I was just going to make a, a comment and ask a question. Um, and my comment would be to support what Director Arbor was saying about free transit passes uh, for those 18 and under. My 16-year-old daughter has a transit pass, and she's currently on a bus to Cumberland as we speak. And uh, it's a free it's a free transit thing, courtesy of me. Uh, but I know that the way she looks at it is like she's always got that and makes it a part of her thinking whenever she's planning on moving around the valley. It's like a free A to B, no matter like whenever buses are running, and uh, that just gets a a, a, way, a mindset uh, of using transit. And the question I had was about. The ridership bounce back that we experienced here. You said we were about 105% uh, of previous ridership compared to 80% in other communities. And that's a substantial difference. And you cited in the slide a couple of factors that are kind of outside of the control of the service, things like densification and affordability. I was saying, what, what would you point to that's inside the control of the service decisions that the board has made and that you've implemented that you think are, mm -hmm. um, are driving that impressive uh, kind of increase in ridership post-pandemic? Yeah, I think, you know, to a large degree, it's, it's because of the decisions this board has been making to continually invest in improved transit. So we have, you know, pretty much year after year uh, had uh, investments from, from the CBRD board to the transit service to do those transit expansions um, through that transit improvement program. And we've been really focused on, uh, frequency and high levels of service. So the you know the number one I think determinant of of ridership is going to be high frequency you know direct efficient routing. So we've been doing that with route number one. Uh, that's where a lot of our investments have gone, and I think that's really starting to pay off as as people are seeing this bus every you know fifteen minutes uh, kind of close to their home and going to wherever they work or go to school, and um, it's making transit a really good option for people. So I think that's the biggest thing is just to continue to improve, make those decisions to improve transit and, you know, do it in a way that keeps ridership in mind, but also now, you know, maybe balances some of those other social um, and equity pieces too, because those are, aren't maybe going to generate a ton of ridership, but they're very valuable and beneficial in other ways. And maybe I just could speak to the, uh, your other point, the uh, fares. So we are going to be doing a fare review, hopefully this year or this, or this coming year. And that would be our opportunity to kind of make that, you know, decision on free fares for under 18. So we can get BC Transit to review that, provide some analysis and, and commentary on 
on that and then the board could decide to to make that free for under 18 or under 19. So it sounds like that would be coming back to the board without any need for a motion or any further direction from us as, as that. Yeah, yeah, we've also we've already heard heard some interest in in that in the past from the board and uh, through the kind of annual, not annual but the regular cycle of fair reviews. We typically do them every three three years or so, so we're we're kind of due at this point, uh, and we're just operationally planning to do that fair review in twenty twenty three, and so we we've, we've landed that uh, that concept on on the list for consideration already. Okay, great. Thanks. And just to your previous point, just think it's really encouraging to see the decisions made at this board table to invest in transit are showing yeah. very concrete and significant uh, increases in ridership. That's, that's good news. Yeah, right, thanks that's for the report. And that's for receipts. So uh, all those in favor? And that passes unanimously. And uh, next is the orientation for homelessness support services. Uh, moved by Hillian, second by Grieve. Thank you very much, you. Chair and Directors, and Alana Malayli is here to provide this orientation. Great. Thanks very much, Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a gift for you, and I have combined, I hope you see it as a gift, I've combined item 10 and 11. So I'm gonna to speak to you about, I'm gonna to speak to you about both our function 450, which is the emergency shelter uh, and supportive housing land acquisition function, as well as the homelessness support service function. The purpose of these, this first service, this is our emergency shelter and uh, supportive housing land acquisition service. The purpose of this service is to, just exactly as, as its title implies, is to acquire land for either emergency shelter and or supportive housing. Um, and these two uh, uses are both defined right within the bylaw. This is one of the few CBRD services that includes the entirety of our region. So being all three municipalities, and all three electoral areas, including the islands. And decision-making under this service rests uh, with you, the board. Uh, service, um, homelessness and support service. So this service was established in order to provide funds to one or more local non-governmental organizations in order to deliver uh, both housing and supports in order to address homelessness in our region. Uh, the decisions or the recommendations for allocation are based on a five-year action plan that is board approved. And you've used this service to fund a whole range uh, of projects, including uh, pre-development costs, capital costs, and support services for those who are experiencing homelessness or those citizens who are at risk of becoming homeless. So on the land acquisition service, this, this service was established in 2009 through an alternative uh, approval process in order to authorize the board of the day's purchase of land. Property within the city of Courtney was acquired, but was subsequently sold. And since that time, uh, the service has remained relatively dormant. Um, in 2022, however, you invested in this service in order to start to build a bit of a reserve so that the service would be available to you if you wanted to put it to use as an opportunity might arise. Uh, and there's no staffing to this service. So it's something that we are, uh, we, we um, address through the planning and uh, development services group. 451, I would suggest, and this is why I put these two presentations together, I would suggest this is a complementary service to 450. This service was established following a referendum back in 2015. It was established through bylaw. Um, uh, as you know, the service has been used to support a number of projects uh, and provide supports, including support for the coalition to end homelessness and the inclusion of peers in the processes of the coalition. The focus in 2023 under current projects for these services uh, in 450 will be initiation of the first service review. This is a service review that's required in establishment bylaw, but we haven't ever done one. So this would be the first one that we undertake. 
Um, it will include consultation with the service participants, as well as the coalition to end homelessness, both the leadership team and the various member agencies. And further, um, the work will include consideration of how this land acquisition service can support the homelessness and support service function 451. And we'll report back to you on that work in the spring uh, prior to your June strategic planning session. Focus in 451 will be continuing implementation of the service review recommendations that arose in 2021, uh, as well as looking at how the landscape has changed um, with the pandemic. So updating some of the context around those recommendations and making sure that we are uh, using it to its full potential. Following the 2023 budget approval, we will continue to prepare funding agreements with the non-governmental agencies who receive allocations, uh, those who are proposing projects, and we'll continue to um, liaise with the coalition's coordinator to understand how best the CBRD can support community efforts to address homelessness and um, to support those residents who are experiencing homelessness. Okay, now dollars and cents. So funding for 450. This service is funded through tax requisition. In 2022, that amounted to just shy 25,000 for the electoral area contribution and just over 45,000 for the municipal contribution. The operating budget was established in order to put $50,000 in reserve to begin, as I mentioned, rebuilding this service so that you can use it if an opportunity arises. We also included some budget for study work. I mentioned this previously and that, that work is underway now and we will uh, be complete by spring of 2023 so you can um, you can benefit from from that information uh, prior to entering into strategic planning in June. Oops. In the homelessness and support service, um, the operating budget reflects tax requisition grant funding from the Strengthening Community Services Program, and a prior year surplus. So uh, there's the breakdown on the um, tax requisition between the electoral areas, not including Demon and Hermby, and uh, Cumberland and Courtney. This service does not include Comox. Um, you'll recall that the, the grant money was transferred to uh, the city, the administration for the city, and, and the, city, the city is undertaking a lot of great work using that money as we speak. And then the prior year surplus, that was money that was um, uh, uh, rolled over into 2022 from 21 because one of the agencies um, hadn't hit a milestone that they were hoping to. So that, that amount just got rolled over. So operating expenses so far in, and this is all we expect for 2022, we've got $265,000 and that's broken up among three organizations, Wache Friendship Center, the Transition Society and um, Habitat for Humanity. And then because the service doesn't have a staffing allocation to it, there is a management fee that gets transferred to the Regional Growth Strategy Service. So we'll be presenting uh, both of these proposed budgets to you in February. Uh, in the meantime, we propose to continue working to implement the 2021 service review recommendations for 451. And as I say, undertake that required service review for 450. Among other purposes, we hope that this work will support you in preparation for that June strategic planning session, um, when you'll be considering among other things, or, or when you might consider among other things, how you could best leverage these services to work uh, in a complementary way to um, relative to your jurisdiction and the available partnerships in order to deliver on your strategic priorities. I've listed some of the, 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 the breakdown on the work items here. So, as I said, service review for the land acquisition function. Um, we've got a, a work item in here that uh, we would suggest is a part of our regional housing needs assessment work, and that's an assessment of homelessness needs in the, in the community. And we're working with a consultant to draft a scope of work uh, right now for that. And then the other thing that we'll be speaking to you more about in the budget is uh, the possibility of preparing a community action plan to end homelessness. This is a this is a this is different from the work that the coalition uh, does, which in 2022 they presented you with their housing plan. Uh, so as I say, we'll speak to you uh, about some of the nuances, but really the crux of this is to try to get us to a place where you can use this service and 450 really strategically to address homelessness and to align it with your um, strategic priorities. So we look forward to working with you uh, to continue using these services to help you deliver on your priorities. 
2023, and I'm happy to speak to any questions that you might have. Great, thanks, Lena, and Dr. McCollum. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, I was just curious about, um, I don't know what slide that was on, I should have wrote it down, uh, the uh, plan for the upcoming tax requisition for service 450. It looked like there was $50,000 um, per reserve and then $20,000 for the study or a study. Uh, and I wasn't clear if that was um, part of the starting of a service review, if that was the $20,000 or was that for different study work? Um, through Mr. Chair, so the slide that I showed you, and I'm sorry, I can't return for some reason, uh, showed you the 2022 operating budget. So that's what you approved was 50,000 contribution, thanks Lisa, contribution to reserve and here we go. Uh, Fifty thousand dollar contribution to reserve, and then twenty thousand. And in twenty, at the beginning of that um, process, we were calling it the site suitability analysis work. And really, that was our effort to try to understand what would an ideal site look like. In very short order, we found that the landscape had changed quite a bit from when we had um, spoken to you about that through the budget process, and and certainly now, uh, we learned that um, that one of the municipalities might have an opportunity for partnership, and so we kind of. Put that work uh, on hold until we heard back from our municipal partners and now that work I would suggest has morphed into looking a little bit more broadly so that is the work that I described but this is this 20,000 was approved in 2022 and we'll be able to use that funding uh, for the work that I discussed in in 2023. Okay um, thank you for that um, yeah, I was just a little bit confused because at the beginning it showed that the requisition for 450 was 50,000, but then our operating in 2022 was 70,000, according to the slide. And then um, also for service 451, I think the first slide that showed um, our overall requisition was 265, but then a subsequent slide um, showed it as um, 349. So. I just wasn't. Uh, uh, so a couple of things uh, through Mr. Chair. The requisition on 450. Um, I didn't break that down for you here. Okay, I, I think maybe I misinterpreted. Okay. Maybe, yeah, I see there it says 50,000 to reserve and I thought that that's all that we were funding was just reserve for now, but now I see that there was an additional $20,000 for okay. the study and that's gonna be a carryover then because that work hasn't, um, it's under me. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. right. Thank you. And, and then, what was the reason for the discrepancy on the um, for for um, service four fifty one? Um, um, through Mr. Chair, I think you know this reference to the two hundred sixty five thousand. That is the money that you allocated in twenty twenty two. The reference that I made to the overall revenue within the service included both tax requisition as well as the grant. So that's the distinction on the operating budget. Uh, there we go. That one point four seven zero. So it includes um, the breakdown between the uh, municipalities and the electoral areas on requisition, contribution of the grant, and then the 27,000 and change on prior year surplus. That comprises that overall operating of 1.47. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hey, okay. and uh, Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Alana. I'm just wondering if you could um, clarify the extent of collaboration uh, with our community partners and uh, municipal partners on the plans going forward. Um, through Mr. Chair, I think certainly going forward, our hope would be that we could have uh, more collaboration than, than we've been able to have. We recognize that, you know, we're still... Um, Staff plates are very full, as you well know, you hear from, from your staff. Um, so I think folks are trying their best. What our effort is to do is to take as much of the work off the municipal staff as we can through the service and rather come with, you know, pitching with, uh, recommendations prior to coming 
to you. So the consultation that I reference in the um, upcoming service review for 450 would be that, right? Like we know that um, because the service really hasn't been used, there isn't going to be broad understanding of what that service is or what it could be, I would expect, among our municipal partners. Some folks were around for our community partners. Some folks were certainly around uh, when the service did purchase uh, a site in Courtney those years ago. Uh, but I think it's it's really about reintroducing the service. And so we know that staff, um, municipal staff will have limited, likely limited time to um, focus on these projects. And so our goal is to do the heavy lifting. Thanks, that's maybe another uh, subject that we need to knock on the minister's door about. Because um, really, again, this is a provincial responsibility in my view. Um, I was curious though about the um, homelessness assessment um, and uh, I wasn't 100% clear about what, what actually is being assessed. Uh, we're not talking about something similar to the pit count? Um, through Mr. Chair, I don't think so. So this was something that came out uh, in the consultation for the 451 service review. It was a recommendation that was supported by the co-leadership leadership team at the time. That team is, is uh, since comprises different folks. Um, but really, yeah, it's digging into where the core needs on homelessness Arise. So, for example, uh, it's been suggested that we, um, I'm just going to flip to this wheelhouse at the end. Um, so, the, I'm gonna, I would suggest that the these two services, our efforts really, we're endeavoring to direct them to the two blue parts of the pie, emergency shelter and short-term supportive housing. And then, in some instances, to the one green piece, which is the long-term supportive housing. In the past, we've had allocations go to, you know, a number of pieces on this wheelhouse. And so the homelessness needs assessment, I think, is really about digging into what are the specific needs of those folks who are experiencing homelessness, either chronically or perhaps invisible. I'm going to be able to speak to you a lot more about that once we, um, uh, through the, the budget process, uh, to share more details. So we we don't have sufficient data on that from uh, previous uh, reports that have been compiled? Uh, through Mr. Chair, I think the data that we have is that there's a need. And so we've drawn on the pit count. There will be another pit count in 2022. We've drawn on our homelessness, or pardon me, our um, housing needs assessment. It was also a recommendation that came out of the regional housing needs assessment to dig into this sector in particular around need. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. Great, thank you. And uh, Director Hardy. Yeah, thanks. Going back to that slide for uh, 451, I, uh, I noticed that Comox isn't, the city, or town of Comox isn't involved in that, and neither are the islands. I'm just kind of wondering why. Through Mr. Chair. I don't know if I froze up or not, or if you heard my question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, we, we pay it by contract so that we have some autonomy with the money that we put in. So do the electoral areas have the same, same ability as the town of Comox then and uh, Hornby Island and Devon Island? True, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could just clarify, Director Hardy, so these are the participants that um, uh, joined the service at its time of establishment. Is your question, please, if you could repeat your question. Yeah, I'm just wondering again, like it, it looked like through a tax requisition, the electoral electoral areas are having to pay, but Hornby Island and Demon Island, if I'm assuming that's what is meant by no islands, and the town of Comox aren't, aren't paying into 451. And I was just wondering uh, why. Um, Mr. Chair, my, our response uh, would be just that those were the participants that agreed in the beginning that this was a service they were willing to participate in. It's not uncommon for Electoral Area A to, um, to uh, not include the islands in some services. And that was the case here. Um, you know, a, a, a service review is the means by which reconsideration might be given by any participant as to its, its participation in a particular service, but that's a rather long-awaited process. 
but otherwise, um, you know, some discussion with with the participants as to what the interests of your electoral area may be or may not be in the service would be a first step if, if you were considering change. Okay, uh, if, if I could ask another question again, um, I, I think the, the board just approved some funding towards the audits for homelessness, uh, you know, just about an hour ago or so. So I'm just kind of wondering why um, funds are being directed towards homelessness over on the islands, but like the islands aren't aren't paying something back in uh, to the program that that we're kind of directing dollars towards. Um, what happens on the islands, both Hornby and Demon, is that they sometimes do their own services independently, and that's the case. Um, the two projects were our ho um, affordable housing projects, um, uh, separate projects on Demon and Hornby. Initially, the director was going to use the, the community works funds that were allocated to the islands for the, supporting that, but that's not permitted through, through that fund. So the director is looking at another service that would that is solely um, um, requisitioning funds from the islands to support those initiatives, not taking money from the rest of the uh, regional district to support those initiatives, but but finding a service that is island specific to support those initiatives. So follow up if I could, Vice Chair, in, in regards to um, voting towards dollars for various programs, if these, say for example, it's the town of Co-Watch or, or islands, uh, the area A, um, are, are they still voting on, on the approval of dollars that go towards these various programs if they're not paying into them? Um, just, just looking for clarification on that. Yep, no, um, um, areas that do not participate, do not vote, it's just the participating members, so Comox won't vote on these matters, but the electoral okay. area A being partly in the service will will have a vote on, on the uh, on the um, priorities work plan and allocation of monies. And I think uh, Director Graham was wanting to respond to some of the comments on, yeah. on Comox, so to you. Yeah, so um, it's not fair to say that we don't pay because we do, we just pay by contract and it gives us some say in where our money goes. Um, once you join into a service and when this was established, it was decided to do it that way because once you're into a service, it's, as you know, from economic development, Richard, it's almost impossible to get out. So for you to switch over to go to the way we're doing it would be really difficult to do today. But we did it right at the beginning. So it's not that we don't pay, we just pay in a different way. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, Director Hardy, did you have any further questions just from what uh, Director Grant said? No, I just said thanks. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And I'll just uh, queue up Director Warren. Great, thank you, um, Chair, Vice Chair. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just curious. Uh, well, first of all, we are always ever so hopeful in Courtney that um, the powers that be at the higher levels are going to um, substantially uh, contribute to um, proper housing for the literally dozens and dozens of people who are on our streets right now downtown in the cold and I'm being a little dramatic perhaps, but I don't think it would be dramatic um, for those folks um, to say that it's heartbreaking um, to see the number of people that are out um, unhoused. Having said that, I mean, this service started um, and and the, the land acquisition was in the city of Courtney, but we do know through the, not so much through the pick count because I think it's difficult to determine um, the magnitude of this outside of the city center. So I'm wondering if if some of the work will be to tease that out a bit because we know um, we know that there are people sleeping in the rough in rural areas as well, which makes it even more problematic for them because they're not close to services and they're really at risk. And of course, we know there are people in substandard housing in rural areas as well, and those. Um, precariously housed folks. So I'm, so I guess I'm just, um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of our 
role director. Oh, we do have Director Hardy on, on online and Director Grieve here. But I guess I'm curious if some of that information is being teased out and if there's an opportunity um, to uh, to address some of some of that in in some of the other areas outside of Courtney as well. Thanks. Oh, through Mr. Chair, absolutely. So that's part of the, the rationale for not just using the pit count as the, the marker of what homelessness needs look like in, in the region. You'll recall that when we did the regional housing needs assessment, um, we did that broad regional look, but we also dug into each jurisdiction. So each area A, B, and C each also had their own information. And so ideally, that's what we'd be looking at here. And knowing that uh, homelessness looks can look quite different, depending whether you're a rural citizen or resident, or, or an urban resident, uh, and the needs are different. All right. Um, seeing no further questions, are there any further from Director Hardy? Lisa? Okay, great. Um, I just have one question I was going to ask myself, which is the, um, the community action plan uh, that was referred to is going to be distinct from the, uh, the coalition's uh, plan. I'm just wondering what the relationship is between the two and how they're sort of uh, interacting to make sure that there's sort of no duplication and full coverage. Mm -hmm. Through Mr. Chair, or sorry, yes, through Mr. Chair, um, the 2022 housing plan that the coalition uh, introduced to you with the 2022 budget, that really looks like um, it sets the objectives for the uh, coalition's work, and it sets out, I would suggest, the work plans of the agencies that are involved with the coalition which is a needed and very good thing for the coalition to have. I think what we're talking about would be uh, a strategic plan for you to deliver these services, right? So really specifically looking at what is the CBRD's role? What is the role that you want to play relative to your, your jurisdiction and to the needs that we have in the community? And then defining what are the actions that we can take as local government to address this issue, quite specifically around CBRD municipal. Thank you. So they're they're complementary and coming from different uh, different places. Would that be correct? That you'd be obviously taking into account uh, the work that is done when developing the community action plan. Through Mr. Chair, I think that they they could be quite complementary. Um, I think that the effort is certainly not to duplicate work that the coalition is doing. I think that this could be work that might uh, plug a bit of a gap that we have, uh, a strategic gap that we have regionally about how to best use these funds. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that during the budget and, and based on the recommendations that we got out of the 2021 service review. But one of the, the kernels that's in that service review is ensuring that we are aware of which projects might have difficulty accessing funding um, that could be supported using these services. So we have some uh, agencies and their projects that are able to tap into a range of funding opportunities, and we know that we have some that are limited. So it could be, for example, a strategic decision of this board to say that we want to support those projects that maybe don't have a range of options, or you might want to support a specific sector uh, of need. So that's the kind of thing that we'll be talking to you about in, more in February. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Elena. And uh, this is for receipt. Uh, uh, all those in favor? Okay. Fantastic. Thanks very much. And uh, the next will be the Comox Valley Emergency Program Service. CAO, do you want to? Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Howie Siemens is here to present this orientation and answer any of your questions about the service. Thank you, Russell. And through the chair, thank you very much for the opportunities to all the directors uh, for uh, providing you a little orientation about the emergency management uh, part department um, tonight. So as you see in the first slide, I just kind of want to give you an overview. We've been kind of busy in the last little while with a uh, big exercise, uh, as well as the, um, as going on right now is the uh, warming centers that you're probably all well aware of. But the biggest thing you'll see in that, uh, those who've been on the board before is that you'll see function 270. Um, what we've been doing for the last year or so with the uh, support of the uh, Comox Valley Administrative Committee, which is made up of the CEOs and representative from Comox First Nation, is to look at 
um, uh, more regional budget approach for this year for when we get into the budget conversation. So uh, before in the past, we had a 271 budget and a two, uh, 270 budget, and we're trying to make it stream, more streamlined and a little easier to manage some of our projects under that one that one budget. So a lot of the what we'll go over today for you is just kind of an orientation uh, about that whole process. Yeah, if I do this right. Right. Um, so basically, the name of the program is Emergency, uh, emergency Program, so CBAP for short. Uh, the purpose of it is, is we um, are, are required under the obligation of the Emergency Program Act. So every local government and regional district is required to have uh, an emergency plan, uh, an emergency program coordinator, and to be able to address the uh, four pillars of emergency management, which um, I'll get into in a little bit. Um, within this program, we have participants of the electoral areas uh, that are actually true participants in the program. And then we have contracted services uh, with the City of Courtney, the Town of Comox, and the Village of Cumberland. Uh, we do work very closely with the Comox First Nations who are engaged in our community, our, our emergency planning committee, as well as we reach out uh, for initiatives in advanced planning for uh, events on hazards that might be occurring in our, in our valley. Uh, the governance is through the administrative uh, service agreement, so we do have a CBAP administrative committee uh, I've already talked about is the CEOs uh, a part of that for each local government, and then there's an executive uh, committee that is representative for the committee as a whole uh, that we also report to. What is our guiding document for the programs is basically the Emergency Program Act, as I had said, so we need to ensure we're following that, and that is coming under a big review, and hopefully the spring of 2023, we'll get some of that, what that legislative changes will be. We have some, some hits, and we're trying to prepare ourselves for them. The biggest one that we see is uh, truly um, the, the province of British Columbia uh, uh, meeting the Sendai framework, which is actually addressing the four pillars of emergency management. Uh, ensuring that they're an all society approach, looking at everybody's involvement in the planning and process and the engagement of that, uh, looking at disaster resilience uh, and recovery, reducing that disaster impact, uh, and then looking at the response, um, the mitigation preparedness uh, uh, parts of that, those four pillars, uh, and recovery. And then the other pieces that we work with that um, we utilize in our emergency operations center and then through our first responders is the emergency uh, management system, which is basically the response goals and how we prioritize uh, how we respond uh, to different events. A part of what we've done overall in the Comox Valley is we do look at a risk hazard and vulnerability process. Um, we do analysis. What we've done in the last uh, Five years ago was we actually brought, brought down the regional hazard risk and vulnerability study and looked at local governments. So some of uh, the local governments like Cumberland, they, their wildfire came out as their top hazard. Uh, down the city of Courtney, flooding became is one of their top hazard. Um, but we all share earthquake as our kind of our, our, our biggest uh, hazard of consequences. So we do that. It is due for another review, and that's one of the things that's on our work plan uh, as well. So the other things that really are impacting the, the, the program, um, as you probably have, have seen on the news and what we're experiencing right now outside with the cold weather, snow events, as we've increased seen the climate change impacts that are really impacting uh, what we're doing. Um, I know that uh, Carrie McIntyre, my emergency uh, planning coordinator, uh, she's been busy since I think October, just you know trying to get ready for the extreme uh, rain events, the atmospheric rivers, now they are officially gonna call them. They've been known that for weather people, you know, for a long time. We've called them severe weather, but they actually are atmospheric rivers or the, the pineapple expresses. We're also seeing, as of tonight, you know, the extreme cold and weather events that are now occurring uh, to us that other other provinces probably are very used to, but not not for us here. So we have to start planning uh, for that approach uh, and how we can address that. Obviously, obviously, one of the we've looking at it for a long time has been a discussion for many years now is the sea level rise and preparing for that piece as well. Um, and then again, I, as I mentioned, we're, we're looking really at looking at phasing in the Emergency Program Act and what how is that going to impact the municipalities and, and regional districts and what we'll need to do that as a, as a, a team. 
Current projects on the table um, is our community planning piece. So uh, the biggest one really right now is taking a lot of our time is the regional extreme weather advanced planning. So we're trying to work uh, it regionally with all local governments and co-ops First Nations to um, provide guidelines, and a playbook to how we are going to work together to address uh, the impacts of climate change. Um, so the cold, the cold weather, opening the, the warming shelters, the cooling centers, uh, those are all things that um, we are uh, looking for. And a lot of that we're looking at to address our, uh, because of gaps in other ministries that were, you know, that, that are not uh, fulfilling some of that, that mandate. So BC Housing and their emergency uh, weather response planning uh, was a, um, three weeks ago where we found out we didn't have that program in, in the Valley. So we started preparing to try to, you know, to, to help support that in emergency, which is, is Really, it's a little bit outside the scope of the emergency, but but one life lost in the valley is uh, we don't feel it's a great process for emergency management. When we can do some navigate and be a, a voice to that and make a difference uh, to that with emergency management, BC. Uh, one of the other ones we're working on is the, the neighborhood emergency program, preparedness program. So that's the community one where we go out and we try to support communities to prepare themselves. So it builds that resiliency, that all society approach to how we can address an emergency. If they're prepared, their neighbors are prepared and they can work as a team, then that really, that helps first responders knowing that they don't have to go in and, and help individuals because the community is already ready. Uh, another big issue that we do is the fire smart preparedness. So uh, it's been a great success. Uh, a lot of our communities and rural areas have really adopted to that. We are now working with some of the local governments to, to expand that program regionally. Some of our chipper programs, our public education pieces as well. And then the big one that we, we really, to uh, be honest, haven't worked on well, even provincially, is the community recovery development. Is that what do we do with individuals that, like in, in merits and in communities like that, where the recovery piece goes on for years and years and years? Uh, and we're trying to get ahead of that game by really partnering up with some of the service providers um, in the community to see how we can work together as a handoff or a collaboration piece to address that, that recovery component. We work all the time to get community grants, so uh, we were successful getting two, um, one for our emergency support services pro process and then the other for our emergency operations center, EOC, so uh, that's, a, that's a great thing. Uh, the key delivery of that will be training, that's the theme we got out of our Fracture on 5th training our after action report that we come in front of you uh, probably in February, just before our budget. Um, and what we're going to be doing is looking at hosting um, other communities. Because uh, we've been approached by um, Cassette and other uh, communities near, nearby that if they had to evacuate their communities based on wildfire or a large event, we become host and we would like to know how to do that, meeting their requirements as a community coming to our community. So it's a lot of work and we've got some funding to be able to help us guide through that. Training is always our number one, but again, from the after action report, we found that uh, the participants in that really want a multiple year training program. So with that, there's, you know, the, there'll be a, an increase, what you'll see in the budget, an increase of budget to allow more training, more in-house opportunities, lunch and learns, uh, training for the policy group, which is you yourselves that uh, be appointed to that. Um, so that we can go further into the into the learning that we did during our fracture on first earthquake exercise. And the other um, things we're working on is, is really looking at moving the program into a regional service. And what I mean by that is um, having those that are, are participating by contract actually join as participants in the bylaw so that we can actually focus on a 270 budget with a regional initiatives that um, it supports us all uh, because disasters do not have Boundaries, they, they, as we see in COVID, and as we see in the in the, in the cold weather events, extreme weather events, we're all we're all impacted. Uh, and then again, we're bringing forward the after action report to you in February to, to show you some of the themes that uh, came out of that that learning component. So for this year, you the budget will be uh, we can look at it combined, and again, look, provided it to the administrative committee and. Um, they have supported it, um, and so it's going to be 734000 uh, for us to operate this year. It's not a drastic change from previous years. It's just been combined 
271 has been combined to 270 um, with some increased staffing that uh, we're, we're going to bring on board and uh, hopefully with your approval during the budget process. Uh, talk about this revenue comes from the establishment bylaw for electoral areas. So they again, direct payers, service agreements from Courtney, Comox and Cumberland. And again, we always look at for grants, but we're hearing rumors that some of the UBC grants that we're eligible for for the emergency program may be uh, going to the wayside. We're hoping that if it does, there will be other funding opportunity uh, like the national adapt uh, adaptive uh, or adaption uh, strategies that might be coming out with some funding that's focused at us. Um, and then the, the major capital projects that we have, we don't have a lot of large structures, but we are trying to finish this uh, facility, which is a dentist designated as your REOC for the regional district, but also looking at it to try to support other local governments as a regional emergency operations center. And so, right, some of the challenges we had through COVID and supplier change uh, were kind of, you know, going a year past of what our deadline was to finish, but we queued our first mic yesterday. So it's, uh, we're getting closer. Um, and uh, so we're very excited and our volunteers are very excited about that as well. So just talking about our volunteers, um, just again, just wanted to identify that uh, we have now uh, two full-time staff and a term staff position that supports us in this program. The rest of the work is done by volunteers in the community that really support um, what we do. So we have the emergency support services with about 30 of the volunteers who go out uh, to house fires. They open up the reception centers. They support group lodging. Um, the province just pr uh, provided them the okay to go and help with setting up warming centers or cooling centers, So, which is not normally in their portfolio. So that's been a great, they're, they're wanting to help more and that's an opportunity for them being engaged more. We have our radio communications volunteers as well. So they have been a big part on supporting the radio room and its capacity while keeping the our old Moray building that I used to we used to work out of uh, functional just in case uh, we you know we lost services while this one was being built. And then all you probably all know the Comox Valley Search and Rescue. They're not directly in the program, but we work very closely with them because they provide a lot of services as um, like they supported us during the exercise to do the door-to-door -door evacuation component. Um, they do they do a lot of the uh, uh, the search and rescue component uh, for knocking on doors in communities. Um, so that there's a strong relationship we hold there for them to support them as a society and volunteers within our our community. And other than that, I'd be happy for questions. Okay, uh, Director Hardy. Yeah, I, maybe the question was answered already, but I, I was just wondering about the emergency operations center. Is there a concern with uh, the center just being on one side of the river and, and not on the other? Not on the other, okay. Um, through, the, through the chair. Um, uh, so what we've done is, is uh, when we established this, is it actually a better location than we've had in the past? It's, it's on the more accessible side of the river. Then so we lose we lost bridges on our in our own infrastructure. Not again, we don't I, I don't can't speak on behalf of Ministry of Transport bridges, but if we had lost our bridges, at least we're on the side of the uh, where we could possibly get access. We also have the airport on this side as well. So it makes it a little bit um, easier. There is no perfect place for emergency operations center. You you try to put it in an area where um, you have you know the best opportunity for it to be operational, um, and then just Hopefully, if it's an earthquake, it, I mean, we're a post-disaster building here now. Um, so that's that increases our opportunities to survive something that's 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 severe. Great, thank you. And any uh, do you have a follow-up, Director Hardy? Okay, great. And uh, Director Kerr. Thank you for thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about the neighborhood program. Um, again, successful model in many places. Just curious about, you know, how um, like how intensive that would be to roll out across the Comox Valley, neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, understanding that in an event that community resilience, uh, being able to rely on each other, work within a neighborhood um, would actually take a lot of you know stress and pressure off of the you know, central organizing team. So uh, wondering like if that's the plan is to go neighbor, neighborhood by neighborhood and develop that, or alternatively can interested neighborhood communities sign up and say, we're ready. Uh, we have some leadership on our block in our neighborhood. 
can we sign up and, and find out a way that we can better take care of each other? All right. Um, through the chair. Yeah, we we're, there's actually both those processes are in play right now. Uh, what we did was we took a 20 year old program and we re took a year to revamp it and bring it down to a simpler process. Uh, it was an over 180 page document that that communities were left with to kind of uh, do the neighborhood emergency program. And what we've done is make it very simple, get your community started and based on what that looks like to a community. So it could be, uh, you know, a community that's uh, just all they want to do is have a phone call out list, right? Um, so others that have been more organized, which were in the past, there were groups in the Comox Valley, like Alder Grove Road Group. Um, there's, you know, 20 residents out there that uh, get together and they have decided that there's a first aid attendant, there's this person that's a nurse, um, they have a person that's an equipment organizer. So they're, so we're building the program to meet what was there before and keeping those contacts. But we also look at reaching out, like communities reaching out to us as well. So we've had that in the past. So on our website right now, under our, pay, our neighborhood emergency program page, people can make an inquiry and we can come out and do a presentation, provide them a Zoom link for more information, a quick 10-minute uh, video. Uh, so yeah, we're, we can provide that uh, either or opportunities. And uh, Director Green. Yeah, thanks, Howie. Um, my question might be better directed to, uh, to uh, Kevin, but it um, seems to me that it's just areas A, B, and C that are actually part of this service. Everybody else contributes through contract. And you alluded to the fact it would be nice if everybody was part of the service. Um, now, I seem to remember that we're reaching the very top end of a requisition on, on this function. And I'm just wondering if, if I'm correct, this would be the year that we might want to be able to increase uh, our, our uh, contribution from the electoral areas. And I, I'm curious as to whether um, uh, we need to go for any kind of public assent for that, or is can we uh, can we go? I know we can get a 25% a bump every five years on a service. Are we anywhere near that? Just what shape are we in as far as the electoral areas and and the core service goes? Um, to answer the question, we um, we are close you know, when it comes to the electoral areas, but we're not at an urgent matter. And the the concept we have is to redevelop the service and redefine it with municipal um, participation in the service, which will create uh, new spending limits or, or otherwise as well. And further that, if possible. Of course. Yeah. Um, The magic button. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're we're very close, but we see we have a total budget of what seven hundred thirty four thousand dollars, and we were talking about uh, all our climate action stuff earlier on in, in another meeting. But uh, I'm thinking this is a bargain. This is this is scraping the barrel. I mean, we should, this should be one of our our, our major initiatives initiatives regarding uh, climate change because um, this is where the rubber hits the road, and uh, I would like to see uh, some discussion when we get to budget time uh, with municipalities on, on how they can see themselves, you know, being more committed on this because it's only going to take one major uh, climate catastrophe, and uh, we're going to be scrambling. Thank you. To, uh, Russell, should we share some of the conversations we had with the admin committee about? No, okay. Okay. Wanted to check. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Howie. I don't see any other questions. So on receipt, all those in favor? Okay. That passes unanimously. Thank you. And we're now on to bylaws. And so for first, second, and third reading, we have. Um, Recommendation for bylaw number 739. If so, first and second, Hillian and Morin. All right. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. And so, Grieve and, and uh, Grant. 
for third reading and uh, all those in favor. Excellent. And uh, next we have new business and we wanted to add an item uh, by Director Hillian. I believe we need to vote in order uh, to allow the item to be added. Russell, perhaps you can. Yes, that's correct. Perhaps if uh, Director Hillian could just give the subject of his resolution to, for the board's consideration and then they can vote to accept the matter on the agenda and then we can go from there. Oh, uh, Director Hillian. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, arising from discussion earlier today, the um, item is um, based on there being a new Minister of Municipal Affairs that uh, we contact that minister to request a, a meeting to discuss uh, pressing issues uh, of concern to the uh, regional district. Thank you. And I believe we need a, a motion then to allow the discussion of this. So, okay, Hillian and McCollum. And all those in favor? Okay, and that passes. So uh, I think we now move to the motion if you want to make it, Director Hillian. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. And I did share this with uh, Lisa and Russell, so it could be put up if need be, but uh, it's fairly simple. Whereas there is a new provincial minister of municipal affairs, the Honorable Ann Kang, who has written to local governments inviting engagement. And whereas the Comox Valley Regional District has pressing issues requiring provincial investment and engagement, therefore be it resolved that the CVRD request a meeting with Minister Kang, either through an invitation for her to visit the Comox Valley or by way of a CVRD delegation to Victoria. It's already been. All right. Oh, has it moved in second? Oh, sorry. No, we just we just moved to put it on the agenda. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> All good. I'm learning as I go. Okay. Um, and Director Grieve. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Director Hillian. Um, uh, I'm just curious as to uh, what form the delegation would take, because as you heard me say before, uh, the electoral areas are sorely unrepresented at the, at the top table at this regional district. So I'd like us to maybe recommend that it include electoral area directors, or at least one of them that can bring forward the concerns of the rural areas, which are actually quite different sometimes in the rural, and then the concerns of the urban. Okay, so that's an amendment, and uh, I guess we'll see if Director Hillian will accept that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to consider that as a friendly amendment uh, that. Um, uh, such delegation in, include uh, uh, a representative of the regional areas. Great. And uh, any discussion on that? Seeing none, we'll, uh, we'll vote. So all those in favor? And that passes unanimously. And we move next to an addendum. Uh, the recommendation here is that the addendum be considered. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so we then, I, I believe, move. We already, we all of it. Okay. So I think we're just looking at a motion for termination. Then. All those in favor? Okay. Thanks very much, everyone.